So I'm just a little bit late to the party, but I finally decided to binge through Game of Thrones this year. That means today I'm gonna stop and rank all eight Game of Thrones seasons from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your ranking of all eight seasons of Game of Thrones. One more thing before we get started. This video is brought to you by Noom. Noom is a new way to get healthy and lose weight that uses science and psychology to teach people how to live healthier lives. Other programs focus on quick fixes and gimmicks. Noom is about a holistic approach to creating healthier habits. It's all about teaching you how the mind works and the why behind your decisions so that you can make healthier, longer lasting habits. Noom is about learning, not just dieting for life change. So they have lessons on why certain foods are better for you. It teaches you how to break the behavior chains and identify your triggers that lead you down destructive paths. Then they help you modify your actions so you can start living your healthiest life. If you're ready to start getting proper guidance on exercise, nutrition, and stress management, check out Noom by clicking the link in the description. This will take you to a quick and easy evaluation tool which will create your custom plan. With that said, let's get started. Coming in in last place, season eight. An utterly nonsensical conclusion to this series. Now, I went into watching the show knowing just how much people hated season eight. I'd heard a couple plot points, I'd seen a few images, so I thought I was prepared for how bad this show was going to end. Nope, somehow it still managed to impress me with how far off the rails season eight went. Virtually nothing feels like the logical conclusion based off what the show had been building towards. At best, the decisions were lazy and unsatisfying, but frequently, it felt like they just abandoned seven seasons worth of character development. And other times it felt like they betrayed who they'd set characters up to be. In particular, having Danny out of the blue nuke an entire city filled with innocent people just does not line up with any of her previous actions. It was not set up that she would be that kind of person in any way, shape, or form. And the frustrating thing about it is that they had established ways where she could turn into the villain. She had character weaknesses. There was a lot of tension and conflict with John's true identity as well as people being loyal to him. No, instead, she just nukes the city after they've already surrendered. That escalated quickly. To me, that was the ultimate offense because it was such a dramatic shift from everything they'd set her up to be. But everyone else's conclusion was just as nonsensical. Jamie goes back to Circe. Bran, who has no leadership skills and is detached from reality, becomes the king. John ends up back at the wall. None of this is satisfying. They took this whole seven season arc about the White Walkers. They resolve it in one episode and John is non inconsequential in what takes place. I mean, I cannot fathom how any of these ideas were greenlit, how nobody went to the showrunners and went, please no, this doesn't make any sense. Do anything besides this. But somehow they managed to come up with the worst ideas and then rush through the execution of their bad ideas. Coming in at number seven is season seven. Now I still enjoyed this season, but the writing was significantly weaker than the writing of the previous six seasons. On the positive side to think, for me, I just enjoyed, as we started to see all of the plot lines come together, characters that we've been with from the since the beginning of the show finally are meeting one another, interacting with one another, all these layered, deep plot lines that they've been developing for six seasons starting to merge together, and you can see the finish line. You can see what all of this is building towards, and I liked that aspect of this season. Likewise, seeing Daenerys finally bring her dragons to battle against Cersei's armies, 
there's something satisfying in that. And then with Queen Circe, you get to see a little bit of her, her conniving and having some successes. I enjoyed that. But when it comes to the actual writing itself, how they put the pieces together, dramatic lowering of the quality. The big one that just immediately stuck out to me is that people can just appear places instantly. Like the first six seasons, travel was a huge deal on this show. There's seasons where the whole plot point was one person trying to get from A to B and it's a very large place and so it took time. Here, in one episode, characters go from Daenerys' Dragon Island to King's Landing, back to Dragon Island, up to the wall in just one episode. All the danger of travel, eh, it's kind of gone. And if people get in danger, eh, just send someone to send a raven. Daenerys will just show up with dragons out of the blue to save the day. Likewise, even the whole plot line about them going above the wall to try and get a walker to bring to Cersei feels so much more contrived and nonsensical than what the show had previously done before because it was just such a far, gigantic stretch that this plan would ever work in light of Cersei's history. And so while I didn't mind this season, I still had fun with it. It provides some payoff to it. The quality of the writing and sticking to the rules established by the show up to this point in time, I mean, it just abandoned all of that. Next up is season three, a nicely written season. It has some great iconic moments and sequences, but for me, just a little bit too much setup. And for that matter, a lot of people wandering around in the middle of nowhere for the entire season. You've got Arya with the Merry Men. You've got Bran headed up north. You've got Jon walking around with the Wildlings. And there's just a bunch of people that spend episode after episode just traveling somewhere without any big payoff at the end of it. Likewise, you have Theon, who's just stuck in a room being tortured the entire season. Daenerys spends half the season negotiating about getting the Unsullied. So just a bunch of things that kind of slowed it down. Now, at the same time, you get episodes like with like the Red Wedding, which obviously one of the most shocking horrific WTF moments in television history where it just takes the direction you think the show is headed and just turns it entirely on its head. And you realize, nope, that's not what this show is about at all. That entire plot thread direction cut off almost instantly, setting up a bunch of new possibilities. Daenerys, when she finally gets the Unsullied and has her dragon torch the slave owner, amazing stuff and then as they decide to follow her as free people like you're seeing her rise up and become this person that she's been telling us that she's going to be since the very beginning of the show powerful powerful awesome stuff so in general a season that when it gets to the payoff or the tragedy it goes big but there's just a lot of moving the pieces around to set up the payoff that actually comes in the next season. Number five, season five, a lot like season three. This is another setup season. There was a lot of shuffling that took place at the end of the last season. And that means they have to move a lot of characters and pieces around here to set up new plot threads. One of them, Tyrion is heading to Daenerys. Another one, Jon taking over at the wall. We've got the cult rising up in King's Landing. So that meant the first seven or so episodes of this season felt a bit maybe like they were meandering a little bit trying to find its footing and then as you move into the final three episodes it like cranks up the energy and has some incredible episodes you have john heading out to go and save the wildlings and he gets there just in time for the army of the dead to show up and We've been waiting to really see them in action since the opening scene of this show. And finally, you see the danger that they really present to the world. And John gets to be the hero that through his actions wins him this entire army of people who are loyal to him. And you also realize just how incredibly dangerous 
This army of the dead is. Likewise, you get the sequence in the Colosseum where all the people turn on Daenerys at just this the wrong moment in time or the right moment in time, depending on your perspective. People are getting slaughtered. And this is the moment where the dragon returns and you see her riding a dragon, torching all of these revolutionaries. And it's just after so much time of watching the dragon grow up, hearing about the threat that they pose and then seeing her save the day in that fashion. I mean, just such an awesome, memorable sequence. And then you get to the end of the season and because of what John did, he's betrayed. You get Awesome, awesome stuff in here. At the same time, though, it's all kind of reserved for the end. The first section, a lot of meandering. Sansa getting raped by Ramsay while Theon is watching. A brutal, brutal watch where it's not the easiest little section to kind of consume at times but with great payoff at the end. Then we have season one, a great introduction to this world and these characters. And in a lot of ways, the calm before the storm, where we see everyone before they're shaped by the events of these eight seasons. We see the Starks for just a few episodes in normal Stark mode before everything else happens to them and John is sent off to the wall. It's also a very dense season that I think is heavily rewarded by multiple viewings. The first time I watched it, it was, it was tough for me to even track along because there's so many characters, so many plot lines, and it's not entirely clear where it's going or who matters. Or And so when you watch it a second time, you realize just how much stuff is in there, just how interconnected these people are. And it fleshes out the backstory in a way that is much more rewarding than when I first watched it. And so in some ways that makes it a bit inaccessible and in other ways it makes it very rewarding when you can finally get into it. Very early on this show kind of establishes that the usual people that you think are going to be the heroes and our protagonists for the long run that's not the kind of story we're telling. It's a lot more layered. It's a lot more complex. The good and the evil aren't as clear as you would think they are at the very beginning. It establishes that what you think you're headed towards is probably not what is actually going to take place. And it keeps being smarter than the audience. It keeps being just a few steps ahead of us. So it sets up that expectation, foreshadows something, and then delivers something just a little bit cleverer than we were expecting that pays off in a way that we didn't know we wanted. And maybe one of the biggest compliments that I can give to this season and this show is as I finished season eight, my thought was, man, I should start over again at the beginning to see what I missed in season one and watch these characters, who they were at the beginning. I want to contrast those two things, that's when you know you've got a show that's done something special that even though the finale was an utter disappointment, you still want to go back and spend time with these characters on the journey that they went on. And this first season establishes all of this so well. And as I've kind of mentioned, the more time passes, the more I reflect on it, even the more I watched the later seasons, the more I liked season one. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. And if you want more Game of Thrones talk from me, as I watched through the show, I was putting out these 45 minute long reviews of each of the seasons. You can check those out in this playlist. I talked through all the specifics and let you know what I thought about it. In third place is season two, a great follow up to the first season where the actions, what took place in those final few episodes has serious consequences that trickle into this next season. If you'll notice the pattern with my top six here, the odd number of seasons I felt were like set up and the even numbered seasons were all the payoff. And I'm someone that thoroughly enjoys the payoff. A big part of that for me was the use of Tyrion in this season, where when it comes to his King's Landing adventures, this was him at the peak of his influence where he was the acting hand of the king. People respected him. He was being successful at it. He was doing a good job at it because he actually cared about people. And it brought the best out of him, especially as you kind of move into episode nine with the Battle of Blackwater. We have this moment where all the other leaders are kind of taking off and hiding. 
and he decides that he needs to do the right thing, even though definitely probably not going to be the most useful actual soldier in the field. But because of who he is, he can inspire others to charge into battle. And you see him really get to be the hero. I loved that about this season. Along those same lines, Rob Stark has a number of victories along the way. You kind of see the Stannis plot line develop. Bran of Tarth starts getting worked into the mix. One of the things I thoroughly enjoyed about the way this season was developed is as you move into like the Battle of Blackwater, I didn't really want Stannis or Joffrey's armies to be successful, but I wanted Tyrion in the Onion Knight to be successful. And that's what these early seasons did so well, is find a way so that there was a character that you wanted to be victorious, but you were really torn on what you actually wanted for the overall outcome of the battle itself. It wasn't clear good, bad, evil in terms of sides. It was all more layered and complex as to what you felt about things. The big thing this season did for me was help me understand and interpret the show that I was watching. The nature of the long form layered storytelling that takes a long time to cook the meal, to get to what it's going to. And sometimes there's misdirects. Sometimes our heroes have failures. Sometimes the bad guys win, but all of it takes its time and it's developed. So the moments feel earned and like the logical conclusion while still being ahead of what the audience is thinking. Our runner up is season four. As previously mentioned, I felt like season three was a lot of setup and a lot of moving characters around which meant as we moved into season four, it was a whole bunch of payoff for a lot of these characters. You finally start to get to see Jon Snow step into leadership, people trusting him and him having big, gigantic victories, especially as you kind of move into that final battle at the wall with the wildlings showing up where he's been warning them and he gets to show he knows what he's talking about. He can handle himself in a fight. And at the same time, you have tragic losses for him when that occasion happens. Daenerys finally gets to be the queen of a city or an area, takes over and what she's been talking about. Now she doesn't just have an army. She has a land. She has a people. She's be seeing the fulfillment of everything that she's been talking about. Arya and the Hound were two fun characters to team up and kind of sin wandering around. But what really elevates this season was everything going on in King's Landing. In some of the seasons, King's Landing could be frustrating for me because there's so many unlikable characters there. But this time, with the death of Joffrey, the trial of Tyrion, all the conspiracies surrounding everything going on, Lord Oberon showing up and you're not quite sure what he's up to and what he wants, all of it so well written, gives so many characters great moments to shine where Tyrion is actually on trial and chewing out the entire room, trying to defend himself. The battle between Oberon and the mountain, just that the ending of that scene was even more shocking to me than the Red Wedding because I was prepared for the Red Wedding. I'd heard about the Red Wedding. I knew it was going to be bad. Whereas with this one, I didn't know where it was going. I could just feel the tension brewing and then... As soon as he legs got sweeped and he went down, I was like, oh, this is bad, bad, bad. All of it leading to Tyrion finally pushing back against how awfully his awful his family and in particular his father had treated him. You just feel that betrayal. And so when he ends up killing his father, it feels like, yeah, of course he's going to do that. So a season that paid off so many characters' journeys. This was the show firing on all cylinders where you had big payoff, great writing, and tons of memorable sequences. But coming in in first place for me is season six. I like payoff, and this season was all payoff. Basically, from beginning to end, almost every single episode had some gigantic twist, turn, reveal, battle, something that was just this big, gigantic moment. It even managed to take Bran's arc, which normally was really boring to me, and find the make the phrase, hold the door, into this like goosebump inspiring sequence where everything comes together for this character named Hodor, and you give so much 
meaning to his actions with a simple phrase in Revelation. You have Daenerys pulling her alpha move with the Dothraki and claiming all their armies. You have her showing up at the end to save the day to finally defeat the slavers once and for all. And of course, you have Jon Snow and Sansa teaming up to try and we reclaim Winterfell, all leading up to the Battle of the Bastards. Just this sequence that's the payoff of what had been building for so long on this show. And it's this epic, epic battle with losses, with victory, and so much satisfaction as Ramsay is finally defeated and the Starks return home, all leading to the next episode where John the Bastard is declared King of the North. Cersei, who we don't even really like, don't want to see her victorious. Even she's able to have a moment of victory where she blows up all of her enemies, um, which has some bad consequences, but it leads to her becoming queen herself in the end. Honestly, for me, as I was watching this episode, this felt like a series finale. It had the satisfaction uh, as you come to the end of the season because all these major plot lines, threads, all these characters have been brought to a point of like a nice, satisfying conclusion to what they'd been trying to accomplish for multiple seasons at that point in time. Unfortunately, it wasn't the series finale. We had two more seasons in the actual series finale. Not nearly as satisfying as the season six finale. But to me, this was the show doing what it does best and spending a long time telling stories and then paying them off in satisfying ways. So it comes in at number one. If you're interested in checking out my season reviews for Game of Thrones, it's right over there. If you're interested in improving your health and diet and nutrition, check out that link down below in the description to explore Noom. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much.